Good evening, all. Tonight, we are talking about the ethical philosophy of Karl Marx. So let's start with his summative quotation. The devaluation of the human world increases in direct relation with the increase in value of the world of things. Now, what does that mean? This is what we call in technical language an in inverse reciprocal proportionality. In other words, one thing is going up and another thing is going down. And that's uh, about as straightforward as it is. So the more we value our stuff, the less we value ourselves or one another or each other. So the big question here is why are we talking about Marx in an ethics class? He didn't write a whole lot on the actual subject of ethics, but we're studying him in ethics for two main reasons. One, what he wrote about history, economics, and politics gives us a perspective on the nature of society uh, that gives us a conception of justice that's highly critical of the practices of modern civilization. In other words, his critique of justice is going to be a very cogent one and one very much in keeping uh, with what we've encountered about justice from Plato through Hobbes and others. Also, his writings, although usually in varied um, distorted interpretations, have given intellectual foundations for philosophical social experiments on a vast scale. In other words, Nobody else in history has ever said, hey, let's build our entire society based on Kant, which is probably a good thing, or on Aristotle, which would be a wonderful thing. Uh, but we've got um, basically a quarter of the world's population for the better part of a century that has tried to set up based on Marx, so affecting billions of people. And what we've kind of found is it just doesn't work. So the only three real communist places still in, in operation are China, uh, which is really only nominally communist and has a very thriving capitalist approach to things. North Korea, they're actually walking the walk and they're not doing well for it. And then Cuba, which is trying to get out from under communism and is struggling significantly, uh, has a big black market. So what we've read for this week is taken from some of Marx's earliest published work. Um, I'm sorry, these were not published at, at the time. Uh, these are four partial manuscripts that were written in Paris in 1844 and are just called the Paris Manuscripts. Okay, so they're only fragmentary. We don't have the entire thing. Uh, and, oh, and this is Beans. Say hi, Beans. Uh, they don't mention his solution that he would eventually come up with to the economic, political, and ethical problems that he's observing in society. Uh, so it doesn't mention the emergence following a revolution by the proletariat, that is the working class, of an ideal equal classless society, something that we'll see Nietzsche kind of responding to next week. So to understand what Marx is after, we really need to understand what he's writing against. So presumably he's writing against a system of Smithian capitalism. Now, who was Smith? Uh, Adam Smith wrote an inquiry into the nature and causes of the wealth of nations, usually just called wealth of nations. So Marx says in this system, workers through no fault of their own are alienated as the inevitable result of a social structure that is generated and maintained by bourgeois capitalism. So what does bourgeois mean? Uh, this is an adjectival form of bourgeoisie. Uh, this is a social class characterized by its ownership of capital uh, and their related culture. So um, this is what the French in the revolution would have called the third estate. Uh, the first being the nobility, the second being the clergy, the third being these guys, and the fourth being, well, the rest of us. Uh, now, the problem with this is somebody always has to have control of the means of production. Uh, you really can't do without it. And so this is anybody that has control of the means of production. Uh, and if you replace them, well, it becomes whomever you replace them with. And so it's, it's consistently problematic and really can't be avoided. Now, Marx himself was born in Germany in 1818, uh, was originally interested in Hegel, uh, but gave up philosophy to become a political agitator, an economist, and a revolutionary. Because of this, he got kicked out of a lot of European countries, eventually settling in London in the late 1840s after he had written this. Uh, he died there in the 1880s, and he's buried in Highgate Cemetery in London, which you can go and visit today if you feel so inclined. Uh, Frederick Engels was his business partner. And his writing partner, he was himself a German industrialist, a social scientist, a political theorist, a philosopher, and the father of Marxist theory alongside Marx himself. So he had written a book called The Condition of the Working Class in England. Um, and in 1848, he and Marx write the Communist Manifesto. Later, they work on a book called Das Kapital, which was kind of their attempt to do what Plato had done, that is, provide a blueprint for society. 
Uh, now, the irony is that Engels was kind of everything that both he and Marx were writing against. That is, he came from wealth, uh, his family were basically war profiteers, and he was writing from the perspective of going against his own class and society, which is kind of strange. He gave an interesting uh, and I think revelatory eulogy of Marx when he died. And here it is. Marx was the best hated, most calumniated man of his time. A calumny is like a personal slander. Governments, both absolutist, read monarchies, and Republican, read Republican, republics, deported him from their territories, and indeed they did. Bourgeois, whether conservative or ultra-democratic, vied with one another in heaping slanders upon him. All this he brushed aside as though it were cobweb, ignoring it, answering only when extreme necessity compelled him. And he died beloved, revered, and mourned by millions of revolutionary fellow workers, emphasis my own, from the mines of Siberia to California, leave it to the Californians, in all parts of Europe and America, and I make bold to say that though he may have had many opponents, he had hardly one personal enemy. Now that emphasis on revolutionary fellow workers is very important. Whenever we see uh, you know, the dictators from China and from North Korea and from Cuba, they're almost always wearing military type fatigues or some sort of uniform. That is, they view themselves as in a revolutionary sort of struggle against the powers that be. Now, the problem is usually they are the powers that be, and once they've defeated whomever they're against initially, uh, they start turning on their own citizenry. So that's one of the reasons why they're very problematic. So to give you a bit of background here, capitalism arises in England in the 18th century, that is the 1700s. So Adam Smith writes his book, The Wealth of Nations, and kind of describes how capitalism would work uh, in a perfect world, in a vacuum. Okay. Now, capitalism has existed for a far longer than that. Capitalism exists whenever, you know, Ig steps out of his cave and he makes a spear better than his neighbor Ook and he sells him something. Okay. So anytime you're selling something for a profit, you're engaged in a capitalistic enterprise of its most basic form. The spread of capitalism, though, Marx says, brought about really fundamental cultural changes. So a Marxist perspective defines capitalism as when labor comes to be treated as a commodity that can be bought and sold in the mart of competitive commerce. So right now, I am selling my labor to the Alamo Colleges and presenting this content to you, okay? Um, you may very well sell your labor to some retail establishment or some food service industry or whatever it is that you do. You know, we all kind of are in this. If we don't like how much our labor is being paid for, we can go and sell it somewhere else. So Marx had said that culture from this anthropological perspective, so from a development of, of mankind, in the form of ideology kind of binds us to our own self-interest and keeps us dependent. Now I have here, uh, let's see, the year is 2020 and this is an iPhone 7. Um, so it's out of date by at least four or five generations at this point, and yet it works for me. Now, could I upgrade to the newest one? Well, certainly. Do I need to? Not particularly, you know, until the planned obsolescence kicks in and so on. Um, I am I'm wearing a fairly old sweatshirt today. My apologies for my casual attire, but I'm not wearing the newest, the latest, the greatest. My car outside's about four or five years old at this point, and so on and so forth. But we like to have those nice things. We want to have the newest, the greatest, the coolest, etc. And Marx kind of characterizes religion in this case, and you know, consumerism can be a religion of sorts, as the opiate of the masses. Now, opium is a soporific; it deadens your senses, it puts you to sleep. Uh, and he says that because you know, you just kind of, if I give you the newest iPhone, you're probably going to be fairly complacent when I say, oh, by the way, the phone plan is going to be horrifically expensive. One of the reasons I don't have the newest one. So let's go back to high school economics class briefly. Don't worry, it won't be too painful. So. What Marx is giving us is a scheme in which commodities, let's call that C, is exchanged for money, let's call that M, and they're traded. The simplest form of this, what we're going to call barter, one commodity is traded for another. I will give you this grain, you give me that fish, or vice versa. Money then later shows up as an intermediary uh, feature. I will sell you this grain for a dollar. I will buy that fish for the same dollar, okay? So in this case, now money is an intermediary. When we get into exploration and globalization, uh, what comes about is mercantilism, okay? Uh, so there's money for a commodity for, another, uh, for more money. So the most infamous and, and deplorable example of this is the slave triangle. So you've got 
sugar, tobacco, and cotton being sent to Europe, where it is turned into textiles, rum, and manufactured goods, which are then sent to Africa, where they are traded for slaves that are sent to the Americas to pick more sugar, tobacco, and cotton, and so on. So what you get here is kind of an abstraction of money. Uh, it replaces this concrete idea. So uh, let's say you're talking about your, um, your bank account. Now, do you have that amount of money in there? Well, yes and no. I mean, you have it. You could go and demand it all in cash. I don't recommend you do so, and certainly don't do it all at once because that's how we get Black Fridays. But if you were to do that, you may or may not get the exact amount you've got. Or if you've got a retirement account of some sort, that's going to kind of ebb and flow based on the stock market. Okay, so it's an abstract principle. Finally, what we get is capitalism uh, in the modern sense where the commodity is labor itself. That is, labor can be bought and traded, um, sold, pardon me, manipulated, devalued, and so on. Um, so nurse practitioners, those among you, your stock is on the rise. Medical doctors, yours is on the decline. Nurse practitioners are able to do much more these days um, with, uh, with much fewer levels of personal responsibility, whereas medical doctors paying much higher malpractice insurance, office overhead, and so on and so forth. So an example of this, we might look at the, um, you know, the revolution of the, indust the industrial revolution of the 18th century. Uh, so you've got John Kay inventing the flying shuttle, you know, all the stuff that you learned about in eighth grade social studies. You've got Eli Whitney inventing the cotton gin. What this is doing is increasing efficiency. It takes worker capacity and capability and really, really marks it up. So by 1810, one spinner could produce as much cotton as 200 spinners were needed for in 1740. Uh, but production is going to be concentrated in those places that have access to like water wheels to be driven and so on. Now, increasing efficiency, though, in this case, came at the expense of the lifestyle of artisanal producers. What's artisanal? It's an artisan. Uh, and if you go to places like Whole Foods and you see artisanal, you know that that loaf of bread or that block of cheese is probably going to be about twice or three times as much as it would be otherwise, because someone's put a lot of uh, care and concentration into creating that for you. Now, what happens here, though, is something kind of interesting. Marx says that changes in this economic base produce novel forms of social organization, including heightened alienation of workers and consumers, because workers themselves don't control the means of production, but they're free to sell their labor to whomever they like. Workers become alienated from the fruits of their labors. They don't feel this close artisanal connection to it. That was the norm of most of human history. Uh, if we look at certain family names like Baker, and Fletcher and uh, you know all of these uh, all of these different types of names. It's Cooper. It spoke to what you did. You know, Baker's baked, Fletcher's added the feathers to arrows, Cooper's made barrels, and so on. And that was the family business. You had this close artisanal connection to it. Now, not so much. Uh, I read something a couple of years ago that said that the average American adult, you know, so 18 and over, is going to go through 17 different career changes. Uh, in their adult life. And I mean, that's pretty frequent. Figure if you work for say 40 years from, you know, 18 to 58 or 60 or so, and you retire at 60, that's about one change every couple of years. That's pretty rapid movement across there. Now, <clears throat> if we talk about our key concepts here, uh, for instance, alienation, so Marx believes we get alienated in basically three different ways. We're alienated from the products of our labor because they're not controlled by us. Uh, they're controlled by something else. And they, as soon as we make them, you know, if you're the Subway sandwich artist, as soon as you finish your sandwich making, uh, it takes on the life of its own as a commodity that's gonna be sold to someone. You're also alienated from your own productive activity because it's not intrinsically satisfying you're only doing that because you got to pay the bills. You got to feed yourself, clothe yourself, keep shelter, and so on. And you're alienated from your species life because that productive activity uh, that's characteristic of humanity, Aristotle would say that's thinking, um, it, it really is not that anymore. You know, your Subway sandwich artist doesn't have to think of a whole lot of stuff. They're being told what toppings to put on there and how to go about it. Okay. And that's not to denigrate Subway sandwich artists. I love your stuff. The Italian BMT is my jam. All right, next key concept is objectification. So for Marx, objectification, this is this phenomenon that takes place when our activity gets transformed into an object or is merely considered as one. 
So this would be like saying, you're not really a person anymore. You are merely the person putting my sandwich together for lunch. You're not really an individual with your own thoughts and desires. You're just the person who watches my kid during the workday. Things like that, that the object the worker produces becomes the objectification of their labor. And then finally, the universal human activity he says is universal, kind of following in the same sense as Kierkegaard, and therefore it ought to be free. So animals, like beans here, only produce in instinct, in result of some immediate need. If he's hungry, he goes in the kitchen and he gets something to eat. If he's thirsty, he goes into his water bowl and he gets something to drink. But human production activity aren't governed just by instinct and aren't just a response to our physical needs. We're capable of culture. We can write great literature. Um, there, you can kind of peek into my library behind me there. It's full of books, okay? We can shape our environment. I've got the heater going on behind me because my house is 117 years old and it's cold. The natural world can be shaped by our conscious activity. We can act according to really complex normative standards and so on. So Marx says there's something there. Now, in the first manuscript, this is where he tells us we sink to the level of commodity as workers, and our misery increases with the power and volume of our production, but it's not necessarily going to accumulate capital in our bank accounts, but accumulate in a few hands. Now we start getting this distinction between capitalist and landlord, between agricultural laborer, industrial worker. Some of this disappears and divides into two classes of property owners and propertyless workers. Now, he tells us that what really what we've got to focus on here is acquisitiveness. We like stuff. We like a whole lot of stuff. Um, am I going to get time to read every single book in that library behind me or on the shelf over here behind y'all or in that cabinet over there before I die? I don't know. I certainly hope so. I'd like to at least browse through all of them, but I may not get to it. I like not just the ability to read them, but the possibility that I might get a chance to read them. And he says, if we go back to a primordial condition, that is, if we go back to the Stone Age, it doesn't explain that. You know, I'm not going to collect as much stuff as I possibly can. I'm going to get what I need to survive and move on. And this is where he gives us that summative quotation that the devaluation of the human world increases in direct relation with the increase in value of the world of things. So <clears throat> whatever we produce then becomes this objectification of our labor. And he says... This appears in the sphere of political economy as a vitiation of the worker. Vitiation comes from uh, the Latin uh, vitiare, to impair something, uh, to make less good or less effective. Okay, uh, We kind of have this loss or servitude to the object. We're so tired from doing the work that we just feel that time has been taken away from us. And what happens here is labor becomes an object which we can get only by the greatest effort and with unpredictable interruptions. Let's look at that. Is it hard to get a job? Well, no, not particularly. I mean, depending on what you're willing to do, you can find a job pretty easily. If you don't mind doing some pretty nasty stuff that other people simply don't want to do, you can get a job. Is it hard to get a job that we like and that we enjoy doing? That's pretty tricky, okay? Now, sometimes students in the past have worked under the assumption that I have always, you know, that I sprang from the womb and was a professor. Now, I think it's a... I've had a series of jobs, you know, as uh, Wayne says in Wayne's world, I have an extensive collection of hairnets and name tags. Uh, my very first job was filling sacks of manure and stacking them on pallets. You know how when you work in fast food, you smell like fry grease? You know what you smell like when you shovel sacks of manure all day? Let's just say I didn't date a whole lot. Okay, so we go through these jobs and then there's unpredictable interruptions. Sometimes we get fired, sometimes we get laid off, sometimes we get uh, the politically correct term these days is reduced in force uh, from our job. And so we kind of fall under the dominion of our product, of our undercapital. And he tells us all these consequences follow from the fact that the workers related to the product of our labor as to an alien object. Now he says the less he belongs to himself, just the same as in religion. Now, a bit of background. Marx has real issues with religious belief. He was ethnically Jewish, came from a long line of rabbis. His father decided not to attend rabbinical school and instead to become a lawyer. And in the already kind of anti-Semitic culture in Germany of the time, uh, came home one day and found that his career had been capped. And so he said, guess what kids, we're no longer Jewish, now we're Lutherans. So Marx felt if you could change religion that easily or that quickly or for that kind of shallow of a reason, 
uh, then religion probably wasn't all that important. And he understood religion as being handed down from a few people to many people. Uh, you know, one person at the top of the church, maybe a few in middle management, and then a whole bunch of people uh, just kind of in the masses. He says, the greater his activity, the less he possesses. Um, I've got a friend of mine, he's a brain surgeon, literally a uh, brain surgeon. I do have another friend who's a rocket scientist also. Uh, they make tremendous money, ridiculous money. You know, you could fit my entire house, which isn't tiny, in like their great room. Okay, they've got cars, they've got boats, they've got all this kind of cool stuff, but they work 90 hours a week, so they never have time to enjoy that stuff. So the moral of the story, kids, is make friends with rich people so you can play with their toys. The greater the product is, the more he's diminished. You kind of get the idea. And so we've given our life over to this craft and it's against us as an alien and hostile force. Now, it says the more the worker appropriates the external world of sensuous nature by his labor, the more he deprives himself of means of existence. That is, all that really exists is our labor. And that labor exists for our physical subsistence. We've got to feed ourselves and so we work. And so we become a slave of the object in a couple of different ways. So you receive work and you receive your means of subsistence. So let's approach it this way. When you get a job offer, someone is not just saying, hey, we'd like to hire you to perform this function and we're paying you this much. In a way, especially if that job includes benefits, we're giving you the means by which you're gonna feed yourself, clothe yourself, provide for your family if one is dependent upon you, um, make sure you have health care, make sure you've got a roof over your heads. That's what we're really giving you is all of this extra stuff. And so the object enables you to exist first as a worker and only secondly as a physical subject. Now, a number of us are working remotely during the Rona, but if we think about this, you know, we drive to work in our car so we can work, so we can afford to buy gas to put in our car, so we can afford to drive to work and rinse repeat. So he says the culmination of this enslavement is the only way we maintain ourselves as a physical subject is as long as we're workers. And it's only as physical subject that we're able to work. In other words, if you aren't feeding yourself, clothing yourself, sheltering yourself, and so on, you're not going to be fit to work anyway, and you're basically just going to fizzle out. So the alienation that takes place here is expressed as follows. He says, the more the worker produces, the less he has to consume. Um, I don't know about you, but I found myself before where I'm working all day and I literally forget to eat. Just doesn't occur to me. And, you know, it's 6 p.m. I'm like, man, I'm awfully hungry. Oh, yeah, you didn't eat breakfast or lunch today. The more value we, he creates, the more worthless he becomes. <clears throat> the more refined his product, the more crude and misshapen the worker. Now, if you're following along in the home game, on slide 29, I've got a picture of uh, Johnny Depp as the Mad Hatter from um, Alice in Wonderland. Now, the reason hatters were mad, mad as in crazy, not mad as in upset, is, well, we have to go back a ways. So the Mongolians on the steppes, you know, Genghis Khan and those guys found that if they sheared their ponies at the height of winter when the fur was really long and placed that fur under their saddles, the combination of the sweat of the horses, the pressure of the rider and the friction of the act of riding would felt that fur into sheets of well, felt fabric. They could then tie, uh, sew those sheets of felt together and make their yurts and clothes and whatever. Now, Fast forward to the 19th century when men's hats are very popular, like top hats, like think Abraham Lincoln and so on. Uh, those were made of beaver fur and not having tribes of sweaty Mongolians and their horses available to them, uh, they had to find another way to felt the fur together. And they found that if they rubbed mercury into the fur, it would achieve the same effect. Now, the problem with that is that mercury gets into your hands, gets into your blood and drives you crazy. Hence, man is a hatter. The more that's kind of cool, I think. You know, that's an interesting story to tell over you know Thanksgiving dinner. So the more civilized the product, the more barbarous the worker. The more the work manifests intelligence, the more the worker declines in intelligence, becomes a slave of nature. I don't know. At this point, we might be getting into hyperbole. And Marx kind of does this. He kind of kind of runs away with these things. Um, you know, I've done research in in places, the manufacturing firms where. The entire job of these two people was to pull a chip out, turn it over, push the chip back in, pull a chip out, turn it over, push the chip back in. You know, these are highly complex things they're working on. Uh, in this case, they were RFID chips for oil lines, but that's really pretty mundane work. I mean, nobody wants to do that and they didn't have iPods or any of the rest of it. Um, so at this point he says, 
Labor produces marvels for the rich, but privation for the worker. Produces palaces, but hovels. Produces beauty, but deformity for the worker. If we're talking about how this might work, sorry, I am absolutely crazy with cats here. <laughs> if we're talking about how this might work, then really what we're looking at here is um, think of injuries that are work-based. You know, you used to get blacksmith's shoulder or tennis elbow and stuff like that. Now we type so much, we get carpal tunnel syndrome uh, and we have to have you know, really pretty gruesome surgeries for it. it. Says produces intelligence, also stupidity and cretinism for the worker. A cretin is a, uh, a way to call someone an idiot. So your assignment this week is to call someone a cretin and see if they know what it is. If they don't, they're probably a cretin. Now, um, at this point, he's really just beating a dead horse. We're concerned about the relationship of the worker to the production. Production itself is active alienation. Um, Part of this, and he's really got a point, he says, we don't fulfill ourselves in our work, but we've been, we deny ourselves. You know, I really enjoy what I do, getting to talk to you about ethics and philosophy, uh, but it hasn't always been that way. You know, I've had a series of interesting jobs. We get this feeling of misery rather than well-being, he says. Uh, we don't freely develop our mental and physical energies, but we're physically exhausted and mentally debased. So the end of the day, gosh, we just want to go home. We want to sit in front of the TV on the couch and just not think about stuff. And if we do happen to talk over dinner with our spouse or our family or whatever, what are we talking about? Probably talking about work. The worker feels himself at home only during his leisure time, whereas at work he feels homeless. Now, in my office down at the college, if you were to go in there, I've got a poster of my favorite movie of all time. I've got some action figures. I call them office statuary over on my bookshelf. I've got a bunch of books. I've got pictures of my kids, uh, my wife. I've got pictures that my kids have drawn and so on. Why do we do this? Because we know it's not home. So we want to make it feel as homey as we possibly can. He says our work isn't voluntary, but imposed forced labor. Now, do you want to prove that even though it sounds a little bit off? Just stop working someday. Go to your job and just stop working. Someone will come around at some point and tell you to get back to work. He says, it's not the satisfaction of a need, only the means for satisfying other needs. Before he knocks over the camera, we're gonna pull beans back over here. Now, it's alien character is shown that as soon as there's no physical or other compulsion, it's avoided like the plague. I've got a very dear friend who knows exactly when she can retire. She's like three years and I'm out. I've got other people who have it like down to the day and it's, it's almost a little strange, okay? Now, in our work, we don't belong to ourselves, but to another person. That's kind of one of those of, you know, we've all got a boss somewhere. The worker feels himself to be freely active only in his animal functions, eating, drinking, and procreating. Hopefully you're not procreating at work. But eating and drinking, uh, a number of us have jobs or have had jobs where we're told when we can go to lunch, okay? Um, yeah, we need you to go to lunch at one, but I got here at noon. Yeah, we need schedule to work, so you're going to lunch at one. Or at most in our dwelling and personal adornments, you know, our dwelling, that would be our office, our cubicle, whatever, personal adornment, some of us have to wear uniforms to work, and we're not even allowed that personal adornment. Well, in our human functions, we're reduced to an animal. You know, Marx may be onto something here. So kind of where we're at is we're talking about species life, that, you know, we don't really have a species life. Who do nurses hang out with? Nurses. Who do cops hang out with? Cops. Who do firemen hang out with? Other firemen because so much of our life is work that we almost feel that people who don't do the job we do can't possibly understand what it's like for us. And so we start uh, getting alienated from other people and we start to change our standards and relationships. And he says at one point, the marvels of the gods are rendered superfluous by the marvels of industry. So we don't appreciate the natural world anymore so much as, wow, that factory can produce a lot or wow, that building is really big. And this happens through this practical medium. Now, one of the things that he really picks up on is this idea of private property, you know, owning stuff. Uh, the late, great George Carlin had this wonderful bit uh, where he talked about your house is basically a place for your stuff. So you get a house, you fill it up with stuff, and you run out of room, you buy a bigger house, you fill that up with stuff. And really, it's kind of true. And he's, Marx tells us private properties in the third manuscript now has made us so stupid and partial, something's only ours when it exists for us as capital, when it's directly eaten, drunk, worn, inhabited, et cetera, that is to say it's utilized in some way. 
Now private property becomes possession as a means of life. You are what you wear. I'm sorry. You are where you live. All right. You are what you drive. You are your stuff. And I mean, in a sense, he's not wrong. Uh, we do tend to kind of judge people. Hello, beans. We do tend to kind of judge people by what are they wearing? What are they driving? Where do they live? And all of these other types of things because it's a creation of capital. So he tells us all of our physical and intellectual senses have been replaced by the simple alienation of these senses, the sense of having. Uh, so Marx's solution to this is the one that gets him in trouble. He goes, here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to take away your stuff. If I take away all your stuff, you will learn to appreciate your senses again. And probably not. You're probably just going to upset a lot of people there. Uh, and so uh, he kind of goes on to saying that the five senses, but also the spiritual senses, uh, have been kind of replaced by this sense of possession. And he's not wrong. Uh, and stuff falls into a social context. Now, problems with Marx are manifold. You know, it, it's a problematic philosophy. Just It just is. Uh, and so we're interested not in Marx so much for the Marxism aspect of it, uh, but mainly for the, the critique of justice that it gives us. Now, as I will frequently address, he is not giving us a solution to it, just the critique, which is itself problematic. Uh, but it does give us some things to think about, uh, especially as we move towards the end of the semester. So that's all I've got for you this evening. Uh, have a great evening, and I will look forward to seeing you again. Bye-bye.